Uh, Thanks. Welcome, Dr. Rush. Um, can everybody see that okay? Carl, is that okay in the back? Okay. Yeah, you can see it. Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks for the nice introduction. Thanks for asking me to be here. Uh, I'm going to start off by talking just a little bit about the Forest Products Laboratory. And um, I'll give you a little background on myself after that. And then I want to give you a, an overshot of the laboratory and what it's done to help the armed forces starting in 1917 up through today. I was on the phone call yesterday with Defense Department folks, and I'll tell you about that study and now on some substitution of materials. Uh, Troy alluded to some of the politics and things that drive some of these things. You might see some of the technical reasons why these things have happened over the last 120 years. Most people here know about the Forest Service, but for the few of you that don't, the Forest Service is the largest agency in the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So we're federal workers, federal employees. Uh, we have a chief who reports to the Secretary of Agriculture, and the Secretary of Agriculture reports to the President of the United States. Pretty simple. Um, the Forest Service, uh, you probably, most of you guys are foresters, you know about the national forest system, which is the biggest part of the, of the U.S. Forest Service. I doubt that many people in here recognize the fact that the Forest Service has the largest research organization dedicated to forest resources in the world. The Forest Service R&D program has about 500 full-time scientists, uh, and we have people stationed from Alaska to Puerto Rico and from Maine to Hawaii at various stages or sta stations doing a lot of different things related to forest resources. Wildlife management, ecosystem management, you name it, we've got people working on those things in those regions. We have one national lab that deals with utilization issues and that's at the Forest Products Lab in Madison. We've been there since 1910. I've not been there since 1910. <laughs> uh, but I I got to tell you, it's, it's a great place to work, and I think Wisconsin should be darn proud of it. Talking about a little bit of politics, when that lab was determined to be there, there was, it was going to be at three, there was a fight between three universities to have that laboratory. One was in Madison, the other was at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and the other was at Purdue. Wisconsin gave more, <laughs> there, I think there were some political things, and it landed in Madison and we've been there ever since. Um, right now we've got about 50 scientists assigned to us uh, at the laboratory. Most of our work focuses on what I'd say is more in the applied area on utilization issues of wood and wood products. Uh, we get called into as a federal lab for a variety of issues, old iron sides, historic buildings, I did an inspection on a building just down the road from here at the VA Center. I won't get into that because they're probably not too happy with me. But we get called into a lot of utilization issues related to wood. I brought a copy. Our flagship publication is the Wood Handbook. You've probably already seen that on the, on the website. It's used all over the world. We've had about 2 million downloads of the Centennial Edition that we did in 2010. We try to update that about every um, 10 years. It's the last one I'm going to have to work on, thank God. Uh, I did the last two and I think that was a tough couple of years. Publications. Everything I'm going to talk about and you're going to see is on our website and is available free of charge. Now, our website's having some issues right now, but you can get it on our website. There are, everything's documented. Even a lot of our older publications, we've made a real effort to go back, digitize, and make that available. There's another source you can get some of that information, and as well as some of the other Forest Service R&D publications. Forest Service R&D has a what we call tree search, and if you get on there, you type in FS tree search, it's going to come up with a with a site, and it's going to show you. You can go by station, and you can go by scientists, and you can get a lot of those pubs. So maybe some of those older ones have been downloaded. 
I don't know, it was before my time, but they're all available free of charge on our website. So what I'm going to do then, uh, a little bit about myself, I started at the lab in the summer of 88. I, graduated, I went to, grew up in lower Michigan and I was always wanted to either be a forester or an engineer. That's kind of a weird combination. Uh, spent a lot of time in the woods in lower Michigan, hunting, fishing, biking, camping, all kinds of stuff. I uh, went to Michigan Tech, had a great time there, and I learned about wood and wood science. So I studied that for my undergraduate degree. Then I had my first job, which was over here in Marshfield, Wisconsin, working for a warehouser company at the old Rodas plant, making particle board and sending it over to every place in the world, including that time we made the doors to send over for the palace for the Shah of Iran. And that was kind of an interesting project too. Continued graduate education, went to Washington, uh, went to, uh, finished at Michigan Tech, then went to Washington State. Worked in industry for a while, Weyerhaeuser, Trust Royce, um, Masonite, and uh, MetroGuard too. So I worked at different places, wood products manufacturers as well as equipment manufacturers for wood. I think you folks would probably be hopefully amazed, I don't know, but uh, you know that the, you've all seen laminated veneer lumber products. Uh, every sheet of veneer in there is ultrasonically tested. So every stinking sheet of veneer in there runs so much through a machine that we built and we sell. Well, I don't sell anymore. We sell to the, uh, to the industry. It's a lot of sheets of veneer and a lot of ultrasound tests. Not as sophisticated as we use for the medical profession, of course, but everything goes into those things. Lumber grading now is done to a certain extent by in addition to visual grading, but machine grading where we run it through um, sound-based technologies or physical tests to evaluate it to get higher design values, optimize the output. Some of the work we've done recently has been to extend that to standing trees in urban environments as well as in the forests. So we're making a lot of progress on trying to get the most, most we can out of those forest resources. Um, so that's my background. When I got to ask to talk about this today, I said, no, how am I going to approach this? Am I going to go data intensive or am I going to have some fun with it? We're going to have some fun with it. I've got a lot of pictures on here. No hammer to anybody else, but since I retired, I'm sticking away from the numbers for a while. Um, love my career in Forest Service. That's why I'm still doing this. Um, let me see. Let's, I'm going to try this and see if it works. Okay. What I'm going to focus on is I got three publications, and these are all available. They cover three eras of our work for the DOD. One, the first publication on your left, that's a publication we put together in 2007. That's a summary of everything that was done by the Forest Products Lab in support of the Defense Department, basically up through World War II. There's a little bit, and this fits in with what Troy said, the stuff for Vietnam and Korea is a little spotty because they took a different approach to things. Everything in there, uh, we searched our library and we had, there was a gentleman who did his PhD in the history of the laboratory, pulled from his document. That's really a compilation of about 10,000, 10, 15,000 reports that we have in our library down there on military type applications, stuff that was done originally for the Defense Department. A lot of that now has migrated to the public sector. All the dry kiln schedules we use for walnuts, think of gun stocks, originally was done for the military department in World War I and World War II. So all our dry kiln schedules originally were done for those folks. So a lot of the stuff we've seen early on has migrated out and is used all the time. That's where I'm going to start that. Then we're going to go to the Vietnam or post-World War II effort. And that, I'll talk a little bit. That there won't be any data. Don't worry. I'm not going to scare you. Don't. And then the last one's going to tie it all together because we continue to do work for the DOD. And one of the ones I'm proudest of is January 6th, I got a call from one of my colleagues in the DOD 
while we were watching the Capitol get destroyed. And he said, Bob, you know, we got to rebuild that. I said, yeah, we do. And he said, you going to help me? I said, yeah. And he said, can I have that wood from World War I that's in the basement of the Forest Products Lab? And I said, you got it. I'll sign off on it today. It took a little more than that with the government paperwork, but we got it out of there. But that ties back from where we are today and what we've done all the way back to April 1917. So hopefully you find it interesting. I apologize for these. Some of these are older photos. World War I, our work started at the request of the War Department. Uh, the first work was initiated in April 1917. The work done at the laboratory during that time frame broadly was in the chemistry area. It was in aircraft area. And it was in um, a drying area. The early work for in the chemistry area had to do with gas masks and coming up with the appropriate filters that would filter out that gas. It also, there was some work done in the chemistry area. I'm not a chemist, so I got to stick way away from saying too much about that. Uh, had to do with explosives and had to do with ammunition design. Currently, we're doing some work on primers for the military. The aircraft work done, as Troy said earlier, virtually all those aircraft were wooden framed, Sitka spruce, and there had to be a lot of work done. At that point in 1910, they didn't know how to dry wood. They'd just stick it into an oven, let it go, and see what came out. Uh, military gun stocks. There was one reported in where they put it, all these walnut stocks that were going to go into Enfield rifles. 50,000 of them were destroyed because they put them in wrong and it, they, did, they just didn't have any data. They didn't have the kiln schedules. They didn't have the knowledge of the wood moisture relationships, the thickness relationships. You know, it takes a little longer to dry a 12 inch thick piece versus a four inch thick piece versus a veneer. They didn't have any of that. So they came to the laboratory, they did that. How to steam and bend those things because there were a lot of parts that had bends to them. We didn't have the fabrication, we didn't have the adhesive technologies, we didn't have the polymer science knowledge we could do today to build some of those polymer systems. At the laboratory, we came up with a lot of that stuff and it's all published in our files. But the other thing we came up with was there was, as somebody said, there was a shortage of wood. The propellers used in France at the time um, were all from high quality furniture woods because there was a dimensional stability problem. You could make those propellers over here under dry conditions, then you ship them over there and in the field, in those battlefields, it was very wet, very moist, high humidity, and those propellers would shrink and twist and turn a little bit and their performance went way down, which was not a good thing for those people flying. They couldn't afford to, they couldn't use some of these other species like the oaks that have the, the, the different ultra structure than these others. So they looked at alternate species. And I'm gonna mention this now and I want you to remember it, but they looked at alternate species, for example, like uh, mahogany, Philippine mahogany, to deal with the material shortages we had with those high quality hardwoods that they were using for propeller stocks. There's some really interesting publications at the laboratory that talk about how they designed the laboratory procedures, how they did the tests on them, how they designed the actual kilns. It's, it's all there documented really well. Out of that came out of a whole series of alternate designs and alternate species options that they could use for those propeller blades as well as how to maintain them. The other thing they had to look at was these people were shooting at them and they had to look at um, the tips of the blades. What were they going to put on the tips of those blades because while wood's good and light and it made a good airplane propeller blade, it wasn't really too good against bullets. And so they were looking at different coatings for the outside of those things. Some of them was weird as deer skin, pig skin, 
metals. You know, it's all there what they did. So the net result of it was they came up with some really good baseline information that ironically we're using today because the propeller blades that are pushing the drones that are used in the Gulf today are laminated maple propeller blades from Wisconsin and northern Michigan woods. Okay, the Shadow and the Predator drones are pushed by wood blades and they're actually wood fuselage and wings too. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So I promised you no data, I'm not giving you any data. Okay, that's World War I. Now World War II, there was the interwar things, I think where things settled out. A lot of reports were written at that time, comp compilations and a lot of manuals. A lot of manuals on the design of propeller blades, the design of wood, wood uh, aircraft, a lot of that. So that was done there. World War II came around and increase of need for wood and the wood products. One undersecretary for the War Department said that the whole crux of the war was based on the use of wood, the lumber, because they just used it in darn near everything they had. As Troy said, he talked a lot about the lumber part of it, but there's a lot of other products that came out of it at that time. Plywood, adhesives, propeller designs, fuselage designs, all that stuff came out of the war effort during World War II and all those products. World War II, I'm going to show you some pictures up there. One of the big efforts was in packaging. They had to move everything from hand grenades, rifles, howitzers around the world, all over the place. And as Troy said earlier, or somebody said, when they shipped them, if they just put them in the bottom of a ship and they came back with parts, that doesn't do any good. So all that design work on that packaging, all the packaging was done with wood and wood-based materials, but the design work was done at the Force Products Laboratory with the industry and with the DOD. All those manuals, design manuals, are in our, our files now, but all that design work was done. We had to design that thing up on the left-hand side there. I don't think you can see it well. There's a big rotary drum where we would take these, not me, but so I say it broadly. they take those packages and they'd tumble them, and they had a standardized test of how many times they had to perform that tumble without tearing those grenade launchers apart. All that had to be done and dealt with and built, and that was all done at the lab. Does anybody know who that woman in that picture is? That's Norma Jean, who became Marilyn Monroe. Okay? She worked in an aircraft manufacturing plant in California, fresh out of high school, and one of her jobs was to install laminated wood propellers on the very first version of drones that were manufactured up here in the right hand corner uh, that weren't digitized control systems, they had analog control systems and they were targets for uh, uh, the military. So they'd send them out and they'd drive these things around and they would shoot at them all day. Well one of her jobs was to put those propeller blades on those aircraft. So um, there she is, as Norma Jean, before she became infamous. On the right, on the bottom side there, I would do throw this up here because that was one of the first drones that was built. These are the new drones we're using in the Gulf. This was all wood framed, pushed by wood. This is all wood framed, pushed by wood. It's a great material. It's a fantastic material for some of these applications. I think, no, nope, let me back up. I think I got, okay, before I get to that, I wanted to bring up something else. Uh, one of the reasons that wood, these, the drones today are so good, um, with the, inv in, in, uh, the invention of uh, radar, you know, obviously we've got a problem with, with aircraft. Wood 
was one of the best materials to use to evade weight radar. That's why those things are built out of wood, is because they, you, you can't pick them up on radar. There's the physics of it. Wood is a very attenuative material. When it picks up those radar waves, it just dissipates them. They don't bounce back. You can't see it. We didn't invent that. Unfortunately, the Germans did. If you look at the Horton flying wing that was invented by the Nazis in World War II, it's the predecessor of today's, um, of our, our stealth aircraft. It's a wing, it's a flying wing, all hulled by wood with a plywood overcoat on it. It didn't um, absorb any radar, or absorbed, it absorbed the radar, but it didn't reflect it back. It was a perfect design. It was very well built. One problem with it was, and this is why it didn't take off, it not, this is why it didn't really go where it could have gone. The control systems for those uh, that don't have rudders on them were very, very minor. At that time, they didn't have the control systems. They didn't have the computing capacity they have now to make those constant adjustments on those motors and those engines. That's why that thing never really became what it was until the advent of uh, stealth technology in the United States, which the wings look just damn near the same, and, but they've got the control systems on it now to adjust and adapt all the time. And so, can't really say we invented it here, but I will tell you one thing. I know that there's wood in our stealth fighters because the DoD called us on it. Some of the blocking out in the wings is wood. It's, it's balsa wood, it's very light, it's got good strength characteristics of it, and it's impervious to radar. So there's still, even in our stealth, we've got wood product in it. Okay, that takes us through just about World War II, but one thing I wanna finalize on World War II that I think is a great contribution from the Forest Products Lab and the Forest Service, at the end of World War II, uh, the Defense Department got together and said, hey, one of the things we got to do for a variety of technologies, the Germans, for as terrible as some of the things I think they did are, um, they had an excellent science program over there. And so the U.S. government put together a whole series of teams to go to Germany and to look at and study the science that was going on over there. There was a forest products committee that went over and looked at things like uh, alcohol from wood, design of the Horton bombers and things like that. A lot of the people on that committee came from the forest products lab. I was fortunate enough when I started there, one of the guys who went over was still alive and he was a chemist and he did a lot of the work and they came back and they produced a report that told what the status of the science was in Germany related to wood. Now that report's in our library someplace, I don't know where, but uh, I think that's a heck of a contribution because there was some good science that, that happened and you gotta capitalize on that. Okay, so we did World War I and World War II Oh, geez. Okay, I'm going to go to the Vietnam era or post-World War II era to today, and I'm going to start with some of the stuff I was involved with and have been involved with. As Troy said, there was a lot of stuff done uh, with contractors and during, the, during that era, but we were contracted with a lot of the Defense Department um, since then because they wanted an unbiased look at things. We're another government agency. We don't have any skin in the game per se, and we don't have any profit margin or profit incentive. So they came to us and said, okay, Bob, for example, up on the left-hand side there, that's a minesweeper that was built right over here in, Pest in um, Sturgeon Bay area, Peterson Boat Works. That's all wood, and again, it was done because it had to be electrically um, silent, and so all wood hulled, the laminated ribs came from Peshigo, uh, Sentinel structures over in Peshigo. 
and they came to us and asked us for some help on the design of the motor mounts of that. And so one of my first projects at the Forest Products Lab was designing motor mounts for a wood ship that went over into the Gulf. And those ships are still in operation today. The, the crux of the problem was real simple. You had big laminated arches made out of oak. <clears throat> and you had to fasten these large uh, diesel, Cummings diesel engines in them. And the problem was when you hit a mine, and this is one of the sea trials, when you hit a mine, the motor wants to go up, the ship wants to stay down, and it has a tendency to try and pull it apart. And you can't have that because if that happens, then everything goes, to, goes bad. And so um, you get that sinking feeling. Then the second part is, that's right. Then the second part is, and we had, I had an undersecretary in my office, and her son was a seaman over there, and she said, I just want you to get my kid home. If that gets hit, I want him home. And I said, oh, we'll, we'll get him home. So what we had to do is once we figured out the mechanism was going on and how to design it, we took care of that. But then we had to come up with a fix in case they did hit one that you could fix while it's in the water and while it's offshore. And so we did. It was, basically, it would split. And then we went back in and we put giant lag bolts in it and pulled it back together, tested them, and we found out that that fix was actually stronger than the original. Mm -hmm. That data is all published on there. So that was a fun one to work on. Interesting part on that, even the, um, you guys in the military know better than me, what, what's the top part of the, the, where all the decisions are made up on that ship? Bridge. The bridge, up on the bridge. All of that's plywood, but there were various layers of plywood. In between the layers of plywood was a fine copper mesh, and it was all grounded down. So even the electronic stuff couldn't get out. So nobody could hear what was going on. It, Total electronic science, a really cool project. The ones we're working on today, we're, these just came out in the last couple of weeks. You've all heard of a product called cross-laminated timber. Everybody's going nuts over it and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's plywood on steroids. Instead of taking plywood and with plies that go that, you just take two by fours and you twist them 90 degrees. Conceptually, that's what it is. It's got some unique properties. Um, one of them is it's very blast resistant. So the military is looking at using it for temporary housing and for housing some of their uh, control centers and stuff overseas. These come in big panels. You can pop them up, bolt them together, and they perform very well in a blast scenario. They, they really do. What happens is, is the wood will absorb it, uh, the, it'll flex, It'll absorb it, dissipate it out, and come back. Whereas steel, concrete, even some of your advanced composites, it'll just blast right through. So they really like that kind of material, and they we're looking at that pretty heavily right now for um, uh, application in those kinds of situations. And that's one of our most recent blast tests. Now, that's not down in Madison. We, <laughs> Believe me, they're not going to let us do that in Madison. Um, uh, we work, but that does bring up something. We work with a lot of different parts of the military. We've, I've worked with the Army, the Navy, um, uh, Marine Corps, you name it, we've worked with them, so, as well as the Pentagon directly. So we've worked with a lot. The one on the left-hand side is ongoing today, too. That's down on a... Army military site in Suriname. One of the challenges we've got today is that during the Vietnam era, somebody, and again, Troy, I'm not going to, I'm going to stay away from the politics like you are, but somebody signed off on the idea that it would be really good to use tropical hardwoods for decking material for large trailers that carry tractored vehicles, i.e., tanks personnel carriers around. Well, they got a good species. It's very dense. It's very hard. Uh, but it happens to come from Malaysia. And today, it's an, excuse me, it's an endangered species. It's Apaton, the Apaton group. So about five years ago, the DOD, my friends in the Army called me up and said, Bob, can we do the same thing with domestic woods? And I said, 
in my tape. I said, hell yes, we could do that. I said, I can do that today. I said, we can do the same thing with one of our oaks, anything from our northern forests, northeastern forests, from sustainably managed forests uh, manufactured by U.S. manufacturers. We can do that. So we initiated a whole series of studies, worked with Michigan Tech, worked with Mississippi State, worked with the U.S. Endowment for Forestry, the industry, and I just got the call last week that the military has banned the use of apiton in endangered species, and they're going to use domestic woods now. So now the struggle is I got to find a bunch of manufacturers who are going to do that for them. But it's those kind of calls where they come into us as an unbiased third party who knows something about wood and who'll give them an honest answer. Like I said, I don't get any kickbacks. I'm, I don't even have a hat from the military. These guys just so. Anyway, that's, so that's ongoing. But one of our tests had to be conducted in Suriname. They wanted the temperature, the relative humidity conditions. There's a whole test site down there where we look at some of the biodeterrogents, I mean, you know, the fungal decay, as well as some of the other stuff, to make sure this is going to perform as well. And it will. There's no question. It, it, it has. So, but that's the, that's this one right here. That's a large vehicle. One of the tests is to drive that thing over and over and over those decking materials and see how much the actual thickness changes. Okay. Just some comments I want to share with you. We're kind of proud of them. These, these come from some of our cooperators in the DOD. Nate's a good friend. Uh, he's, uh, they just like an unbiased source. They just like technical people are going to tell them the truth. And sometimes we have to tell them it's not going to work. We tell them the truth. It's another good friend who's worked on these. This is Keith. Ironically, uh, one of the side things on this one was Keith and I went to school together at Michigan Tech, and we started in 1974. I didn't know. We went different ways. Didn't. I got an email from one of the military guys, and it had a whole bunch of people's names on it. And of course, you never read any of those. I mean, nobody does. So I didn't read any of those. And this guy sends me an email. He says, hey, this is Keith. Do you remember me? And so we've been working on these things ever since. And uh, But... Uh, they use us, the thing I want to tell you is they use us as a source of information. And I think that's our role, and I'm really proud of that, and I was proud to be a part of it. Okay. I got a few minutes. Now I'm going to talk about this one because I think it's cool. And I'm going to talk about the phone call I got, how it tracks back to 1917 all the way up today to the U.S. Capitol. Um, I got a call from a DOD person, as I said, from uh, during when the Capitol was during the insurrection. And uh, a lot of times when we get done with a test or a study, there might be pieces of wood left over and we'll keep them around for a while and hell, we'll use them for construction of our own stuff at the laboratory. Well, there was this pile of stuff that we've been carrying around in the lab for a long time, they had written on this stack of stuff in our basement down at the bottom of the carpenter shop that had Philippine mahogany written on it with an F, which is the French way of doing it rather than the PH. And all the carpenters that I could talk to always said that came from World War I and that was part of the work we did back then. Okay, never looked it up. Got this call and he says, can we use that? I said, yeah, we can use that. I got to make sure where it's from. So in the middle of COVID, I donned my shirt, went in there and waded through that and found that wood and dug it out. There was about 3,000 pounds of it, uh, some of the most beautiful Philippine mahogany I've ever seen. Some of the boards were about two foot wide, about 20 foot long, and they didn't have a single knot in them. Okay, they had the original identification numbers on them from the test studies stamped on the end. And so... Anyway, I'm pulling that through, getting ready to prepare it to the, ship it to the Capitol. And uh, this publication, by the way, is on our website, too, so you can just pull it up. All the stuff, all the contacts are there. And in the middle of it, so the media was getting involved and getting kind of crazy. And somebody asked me, said, 
how confident are you that that really came from there? I said, well, I'm in the 90% range just because I know the history, but I don't have a real kicker piece. Well, next day I go in there and I'm digging through that. On the left-hand side, that's the cover board that was used on the packaging of that pile of wood when it was originally shipped to the Forest Products Lab in 1917. It's back there. On the back of it, on the front of it, it's got the shipping. Shipped to U.S. government, or Forest Products Laboratory, U.S. government, Madison, Wisconsin, from I.T. Williams and Sons, New York. Got on the website, come to find out they were one of the biggest importers of uh, domestic, uh, tropical woods and high quality woods in the world at the time. They had uh, an operation in um, New York City and particularly on Manhattan. <laughs> I can't believe this. <clears throat> so anyway, got a hold of them and those were the ship. There were two of them. Those were the shipping, uh, you know, they, they put on the top with the shipping information uh, painted on there. I wanted to check it, so I got a hold of um, some of the family members of the from the Williams family, and I got a hold of the uh, widow of the last CEO of the company. They ceased operations in 1975. Uh, we had you got to understand. I called her from Wisconsin. I thought it was late in the morning. It was about seven, seven thirty. Uh, she's, they're pretty wealthy. She's from, she's from Manhattan. And she answered the phone call and I said, ma'am, this is, uh, I'm from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, U.S. Forest Service. And in her Eastern accent, she said, well, why would I want to listen to anybody from the U.S. Department of Agriculture? So I proceeded to tell her what I was doing and what I had found. And over the course of the next six months, we got to be really good friends over the phone. Just a great, I met many of their family members, learned a lot about their early logging operations in the early part of the uh, company. And they were just so impressed that their wood was gonna be used in the capital. And so it came, it went from me telling her, hey ma'am, to me, this is the middle of the morning. I've been up since four o'clock, like a lot of people in Wisconsin. Um, she says, nobody's up that time of the morning. I said, well, no, there's a lot of farmers back here that are. So it turned into a great, great thing, and she's mentioned in our book there. But she, come to find out, there was a whole article written on them in one of the older trade journals because their company was so progressive at the time. I'm not, and uh, they were a big part of the importer, uh, import of woods into the United States at that time and they just happened to be an importer of Philippine mahogany, and that's where, we, that's where the stuff came from. And at that point, I could say, I'm 99% sure I know where that wood came from, and I can track it back, because I looked in their logs, and I looked in there. There's a whole series of uh, technical information about their company, and um, interviews and things by her husband and others, that are in the uh, historical, the New York State Historical Society. So able to dig it out, it was a great, great experience getting to know her, but um, just a super thing. So I'm kind of liking that. If you go back there, that piece of wood that Troy's sitting next to, that's what you got right there, and that came from that original piece. So it ties back to what we do today. When they call in and ask for help, we try to give it to them. And when they, if it's something Old we know, we give it to them. If it's something new we gotta try to develop, we try to give it to them. If I tell them, hey, here's the probability this nano stuff's gonna amount to anything, I tell them, you know, I tell them the truth. But I think that's what our role is and that's what the role of the Forest Service R&D program is, is to provide you an unbiased source of information and that's what we do. I think I'll shut up with that and ask you if there's any questions and thank you for your time. Oh my gosh. How yeah. did they know that that wood was the Philippine hardwood in the, in the capital? Was it labeled in some way? You well, know? they identified those way back when that that was Philippine. They, they knew that was mahogany. There's no okay. doubt about it. They yeah, and there had been several remodels of the capital. Yeah, that's why I wonder. You know, and of course, me being 
<coughs> I said, where are you going to put this? <clears throat> I got to know the carpenters in there. He says, well, let me tell you this, what, what offices got hit hard? The speaker's house, the speaker's office. So Nancy Pelosi's office got trashed. And they, they took out everything from the molding, the, the crown molding, molding on the floor, little desk, uh, you know, things for your books and that. They just trashed it. And it probably ended up in somebody's hunting camp and Lord knows where. So that's where a lot of this went to. What they did when they got it, it was about inch and a quarter thick, most of that stuff, pretty clear. They resawed that to very thinner layers, and they wouldn't tell me, but I believe those door. I believe now it's a composite door where it's not solid wood, where those are probably veneered, overlaid over a uh, uh, more blast resistance type material and design, but they look the same. I called in there just the other day and I said, you know, can you guys give me a couple little sticks because the chief or somebody's going to want one, you know. And I, nope, I'm done. They, they said, you're done, Bob. You got all you're going to get. So that's it. Uh, I don't care whoever. Go next. Yes, sir. Well, let me, no, that, that, that's a good question. There's, there's a big effort, and we're doing some work on that, and that, that ties into what we're, talk, it's something we're talking about now. And uh, what we do with hardwoods, um, what I call undervalued hardwoods, it's obvious, it's easy to sell furniture wood. Clear wood, hell, any, I can sell that. Anybody can sell that. Furniture wood, flooring, clear, that's easy. That's easy peasy. But it's the lower quality stuff that has some knots in it. And we started a study with Michigan Tech and some others about 10 years ago. And we published a book on it. It's on the internet. It's called Under Utilization of Wood for Engineered Materials. There's a ton of stuff we can do with it. You can make trusses out of it. You can make eye joists out of it. You can make laminated veneer lumber out of it. Anything pretty much you can do with softwoods, structural material, you can do with hardwoods. It's just a matter of what the economics are and where the shipping is. Technically, it's not a problem. I don't know if that helps you, but technically, it's not a problem. It's, it's, it's a straightforward substitution thing. One of them we're doing with the military right now is the um, pallets they use to ship ammunition around are all wooden. Uh, give you an idea on that, the specifications for a pallet to be shipped, to ship small arms and medium-sized arms, but small arms, has to go for be, hold its capacity from, I'll get the exact numbers, but it's, it's basically minus 150 degrees F to plus 150 degrees F. Basically, it's from, the, from Kuwait to Siberia in one flight. And you've got to be able to drop that off of a helicopter, and it's got to sustain itself for, for so many feet. Because if it opens up, and that ammunition, if you're in a hot zone and that opens up and that ammunition is out, it's all done. Because you know, you've got to remember, those guys are pulling triggers. If it doesn't go bang, they're dead. It's that, that's the way it was described to me. They said, Bob, you've got to fix this. So anyway. Well, we found wood is a perfect material for that, and hardwoods have been a great material. So what we've looked at <clears throat> recent, but they, again, some of the politics way back when, they limited it to, to certain hardwood species. But we're seeing now if, if they grade it a little bit different, they sort a few things out, some of these other hardwoods can substitute in for it, and they're going to perform really well. So in general, the hardwoods can perform in those kind of applications, in any of those engineered applications. Glue lamb trusses, a uh, glue lamb, cross laminated timber, I mean, it's all there. It's just an economic thing. I don't know if that helps you, but we can do it. I mean, there's just no, there's no doubt in my mind we can do it. Somebody else, yeah. This goes back to World War II. I'm just curious if you know if the lab had anything to do with the Navy's decision to use teak on the Iowa class battleship? I don't know. 
My guess is probably because it was the best, it was the premier place at the time and we had a lot of work going on. The best I could say is probably, but I just don't know right off the top. I never looked at that. One thing I do know is the number, the, the, and I've got it written down here, I'll forget it, uh, or I'll, I forgot it, but the board footage on a <laughs> Liberty ship is pretty hellacious. I mean, that's a lot of wood on the decking. So I, I know that, but I don't know. I, my guess is yes, but I don't know.